My father owns a grocery store, and in it, he employs a person whose first name begins with a B. Well, is he hurtful? Yes. Is he condescending? Yes. Is he aggressive? Yes. Is he pushy? Yes. Is he needy? Yes. Is his name Bob? (laughs) Yes, it's me. I'm that guy. We have met the enemy, and the enemy is me. Now, honest reflection concludes that I'm kind of unlovable, but lest I give the appearance that it's all about me, I'd like to extend you that invitation. Are you unlovable as well? Well, biblical anthropology suggests yes. But on a brighter note, God still loves us, even when we're unlovable. And that grace then empowers us to love the unlovable people in our midst. In our text, Jesus tells us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Well, the climate of our times certainly provides ample opportunity. Here's a little exercise. Think of someone in the political arena who just lights your fuse. Now, can you pray for them? Can you love them? Jesus said, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Actually, that second part was kind of an add-on. Hate your enemy was not part of the original script. Hate your enemy is yet one more way that humanity sets boundaries against humanity. Loving those who love us is easy peasy. Loving our enemy is tough stuff. Loving the unlovable is tough stuff. And maybe it's tough stuff because we find ourselves unlovable due to sin. You've heard the phrase, hurting people hurt people. Well, sometimes hated people hate people. So don't be hating. Now think of someone who has hurt you, someone who has insulted you, someone who has threatened you, someone who has bullied you, someone who always needs something from you. Now that I've directed your righteous anger toward that enemy, listen to the prophet Nathan say, you are the man. Remember when Prophet Nathan confronted King David over the sins of over David's sins against Bathsheba and against Uriah? Well, as you hear the story again, pretend that you are King David. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. 
You are the man. I am the man. We too are guilty as charged. To make matters worse, Jesus then says, Be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, shoot. Why did Jesus have to say that? Just when we constructed a doable rationalization for partial prayer and limited love, we're told to be perfect. Now, why in the world are we told that? Well, to get us off ourselves and on to the only perfect man there was and is Jesus Christ. He is perfect, even as his Father in heaven is perfect. We heard Pastor Bob say last week how because we've been credited with Christ's righteousness, that righteousness really does surpass that of the Pharisees and the scribes. And today we hear that Christ's perfection, which is granted to us for faith, means that that's just how Christ's perfect Father in heaven sees us. But the Father sees us through his Son's perfection only because the Father assigned his Son our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 concurs. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Like Nathan, God the Father looked at his son on the cross and said, You are the man. You, my son from eternity, are my fallen creation sin so that I can declare them perfect again. There's that divine exchange. Christ gets our sin and our death and gives to us his righteousness and his life. Gives to us his love. God made us sons and daughters even when we were enemies. Romans 5, 8 reads, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners or enemies, Christ died for us. We who are by nature enemies and unlovable are loved by God. The Apostle John writes, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Now that we've been declared righteous for Christ's sake, God begins to make us righteous as well. He empowers us to do godly things like, like the unlikable and love the unlovable. Being declared righteous precedes doing righteous things. And not only does it precede it, it causes it. With faith, there must be good works. I always like referring to C.S. Lewis's analogy of faith and good works. He said, faith and good works are like two blades of a scissors. To which I always add, one blade just won't cut it. Hurting people may hurt people, but loved people definitely love people, even unlovable people. So if you are struggling with loving a seemingly unlovable person, may I suggest that you find rest for your soul at the foot of the cross. Don't start by trying to whip yourself into a frenzy of attitudinal altruism. Take your failures to the cross and leave them there. God did. So, despite a sermon theme which encourages us to love the unlovable, I'm just going to leave you at the cross. Rest at the foot of the cross. I did a graveside funeral in California a couple years ago. It was really hot out. 
People were looking for shade and for seats, but they weren't finding any because of such an encouraging large crowd. But under one tree, there was one large granite cross, which served as someone's gravestone. Now, I noticed a few people were sitting on the base of that cross, and one of our members gave me a wonderful sermon illustration. While, while some might have, thought, might have felt this gesture inappropriate, this member turned to me and said, I guess there's nothing wrong with sitting at the foot of the cross. Truer words were never said. There really is nothing wrong with sitting at the foot of the cross. There is everything right with sitting at the foot of the cross. It was at the cross of Good Friday where Jesus bore the burden of our guilt and our shame. So sit at the foot of that cross. Rest in the grace of that cross. So I'm not even going to tell you to love the unlovable. I'm just going to leave you at the cross. See what happens. Amen. Oh,